Great. All right, everybody. Hi, my name is Sophie Ismail. I am from Macy. So over the next hour, we will, we will be introducing you to um, the Fulbright program, Macy in Malaysia, uh, and the U.S. ASEAN Visiting Scholar Program. Um, together with me, I have Lina Rajagopal, which is the uh, Fulbright Coordinator for American Program here in Macy. And we have our beautiful alumni with us, Dr. Noor Hayati Abdullah and Dr. Wahida Hashim. They will be sharing and speaking with you to share the experiences. And, you know, this is also the time where you can also ask them questions. Um, you know, what were the experiences like? How can they complete their applications? And so on and so forth. So, and then at, towards at the end, um, we will have a Q&A session. We will address all of your questions as we that we have collected throughout the call. Uh, we hope to end this call by 4 p.m. Um, all right. So, we will talk a little bit to you about um, the Fulbright program. All right, you, know, you might want to go next. So the Fulbright program is actually the United States government flagship program. Um, so it offers uh, unique international educational and cultural exchange for passionate and accomplished students, um, scholars like yourself, artists, teachers, and professionals um, of all backgrounds in more than 160 countries worldwide. So in over 390,000 participants have received a grant um, through the Fulbright program to participate in this program, in this international exchange program. Um, you know, this uh, US ASEAN Visiting Scholar is one over a dozen different programs that compromise a larger Fulbright program here. So in Malaysia, Macy, or the Malaysian American Commission on Educational Exchange, um, it was established in 1963. Um, you know, you want to go next? Okay. Great, fantastic. Uh, through a binational agreement signed between Malaysia um, and the United States to promote educational exchange um, between these two nations. Um, fun fact, Macy is actually one of uh, four, the only 49 Fulbright commissions around the world. Um, for 60 years, you know, that we have been here in Malaysia, we have facilitated the U.S. and Malaysia Premier Academic Exchange Program, i.e. the Fulbright Program. Um, you know, since its global inception in 1946, like mentioned, over 390 Fulbright grants have been given. Um, you know, and in also interestingly, also, uh, you know, over 8,000 grants are earned worldwide. The selection process is actually very, very competitive. Um, and we also, you know, would like to, how do I put this? Um, you know, Fulbright, not, you're just not going to go on a program, you know, merely to do your research, to study, and then, you know, purely academic. We also regard our Fulbrighters as cultural ambassadors. Um, this is mainly because, you know, when you are there, um, you are actually representing Malaysia, and then you are providing them with this platform and um, avenue to, with, you know, for culture exchanges between U.S. and Malaysia. And you also, what we like to call the chain makers, change makers of your specialized field. So, Right now, um, every year Malaysia has approximately 50 grantees um, or um, people that we sent on program for Malaysia and the U.S. coming over here. Um, you know, and while we're here to talk about how your institution could benefit from the Fulbright program, we also encourage that, you know, um, uh, that you explore other grant programs that you or your colleagues could take advantage of. All right. So... Moving on to the actual program, which is the Fulbright U.S. ASEAN Visiting Scholar Initiative Program. It's a very mouthful word, so I'm just going to call it U.S. ASEAN for now. So the Fulbright U.S. ASEAN, uh, you know, it was launched in 2012 um, to initially to deepen people to people engagement and strengthen our educational ties around um, issues that is pertinent and important to the ASEAN region. Um, you know, 2022 last year was actually um, the 10th anniversary, um, and to date we have more than 94 scholars from all 10 ASEAN member states, and they have been awarded for scholarship to carry out three to four months research at U.S. Um, universities on a wide range of subjects that includes um, maritime security, climate change, um, health, finance, um, political security, or wildlife trafficking, or even teaching English as a second language. 
So in order for you to uh, you know, be eligible to apply for our program, first, you need to be a, a citizen of Malaysia. I do understand that we, we, we received this a number of um, questions and inquiries from some scholars who are been working in Malaysia for some time, sorry, five years, 10 years, but however, they are not Malaysian citizens. So unfortunately, we can't process your application. Um, you know, if you're from Pakistan, you would have to reach out to Amina, for example. Um, so we can't do that. And number two, for US ASEAN specifically, you need to have a doctoral degree or equivalent. Um, number three is that you have to be a faculty, university faculty members, um, government official, uh, or professional with at least five years of working experience in your um, specialized field. And number three is that uh, number four, um, in your application, you have or you need to uh, create a strong research proposal that top that addresses a topic of mutual interest to the U.S. and ASEAN region. Um, then you need to have a significant record of scholarly and professional accomplishment. And last but not least, is uh, you need to be proficient in English enough for you to get by, enough for you to you know grasp all the concepts and learnings that you're gonna undertake and go through in the U.S. So for the duration of award and stay, uh, you know, all grants are for a period of three to four months only. Uh, you need to complete your Fulbright grant at a specific, uh, specified post institution and the campus community. So these grants are automatically activated upon obtaining your passport, your J-1 visa, which we will help to um, work with you. And once you enter the United States. Okay, so for the award benefits, um, so here are some of the things that you are entitled for well, once you are selected for the US ASEAN program. So first is of course the chance to engage in research activities at a prestigious US university. Uh, number two is to uh, the opportunity to establish a valuable connection with scholars and professionals from the United States, the platform to showcase your research to a broader audience, um, and then financial support in, st in terms of monthly stipend, um, professional allowance, in transit allowance, settling in allowance, and international travel. So we will cover all of this. And then last but not least, you will also be covered under the health and accident insurance ASPE. And this is only for scholars. Because uh, what, what do we mean by that is that some uh, would bring in dependents uh, you know, to the US while on program. So we would not be able to cover that. That is would come uh, under your own expense. We would only cover your health and accident insurance for yourself only, all right? So managing your application. So we would, uh, Adelina can put in the um, link to the application. So once you sign up and you, you go in, this is the first page that you will see. Um, you would see all of this thing, whatever that you need to acknowledge and then all that. And then don't be alarmed. I know up there is this visiting scholar program. So US ASEAN visiting scholar program is a component of the visiting scholar all right so once you go to the next page um you know you will have to answer all these preliminary questions please make sure that you answer all of these questions before you are able to see all the other sections all right so this is what i mean by i said that selecting the right award okay sorry all right so you would see here, there are a few different types of awards. So you want to make sure that you select the right one. So in this case, you want to uh, pick the Fulbright US ASEAN Visiting Scholar Program. The rest are not applicable to you if your interest lies on this program. Um, and next, then only you will see all of these other sections, all right? So you have the personal uh, information. So you, you know, we need all of this, your full name, your date of birth, your citizenship. So this information would help the committee, the selection committee to identify you as an individual and understand your background a little bit better. And number two is your contact information. Please, please provide your contact details, um, you know, read it all and then uh, give your curate email address, your mailing address, your emergency contact details. So this would help us to reach out to you 
for further communications or update regarding your application. Because sometimes when we are reviewing your application, some of uh, the items is missing. So we need to reach out to you. I know sometimes um, your email can be accessed. So this is when the emergency contact or other contact information would be helpful. Um, for language skills, please uh, specify your proficiency in different languages. Um, as this can also be an asset in certain application. However, for this US ASEAN, you would not have to um, provide us with a TOEFL or GRE test score. Um, and next is plagiarism agreement. So this is where you have to acknowledge and adhere to the plagiarism agreement, um, kind of like affirming that the work that you submit is original and properly cited. So, and this also helped to ensure that the integrity of your applications and protects you um, from any, against any potential misconduct. All right, so next is the proposal, project proposal. So first you need to identify which category of grant that you are applying for. Research or teaching slash research or teaching. So there are three types, research, teaching, slash research or teaching only, uh, you know, please uh, present a well-structured and compelling project proposal that kind of like outlines your objective, your methodology, uh, the expected outcomes, and do articulate um, the significance of your project and how it aligns with the program goals um, overall. So for the section of grant and travel plans, um, you know, if applicable and possible, provide a detailed information uh, about your grant requirements and the travel documents uh, do also include estimated budgets and timelines and any necessary documentation to support your funding needs. Um, for additional information, this is also something that we receive a number of questions. What do you usually want us to put here? So you can include any supplementary materials such as your working portfolio, your writing samples, your publications, anything that could help to enhance your application, uh, anything that can help for the selection committee to see your skills and expertise better. All right. So for the recommendations, um, we do need three uh, recommendation letters. Um, so you would need to request the letters from individual who can speak um, to your abilities, to your character, to your potential. Um, choose recommenders who are familiar with your work and can provide a, a good insight into your qualification. So this is a must. You need to have three um, recommendations. Uh, you, preferably one is from your current employees. So, and then last but not least is your signature. You know, please ensure that you sign and date your applications, uh, confirming all your information is accurate and up to date. And after that, you, you know, before you submit, um, please review all of your applications for any errors, any discrepancies, any inconsistencies, or any missing information. Um, and then you're done. All right. So I am just going to go through a little bit more about uh, what I've covered in case you've missed out. Um, so you know, for your pro project proposal, um, please provide a comprehensive overview of the proposed project. Like I mentioned, your objective, methodology, uh, timeline, and the outcomes as well. So there's no um, specific limit. Like I wouldn't say oh, only 10 pages is allowed. It, it's okay. You can just put it in. Um, usually they will give you a certain guideline. However, if you feel that your project proposal, you know, requires more explanations, more pages, feel free to upload that. That's not an issue and we would not, um, you know, discredit or, um, you know, it would, we would minus some points, you know, that it doesn't work that way. So yeah, ensure that your pro proposal is well-structured, concise, and um, persuasive. So, and then next is that the letter of reference, like I mentioned, we need a minimum of three letters. So like I said, one from your instructors, your work supervisors and your professors. Yeah, so it needs to be submitted directly uh, through the online application. So in that one of the sections, you will see you need to put in their email address, their names. Um, you can also put in the message that will be sent to their email directly from the portal. And you can also follow up, um, you know, and kind of like remind them, hey, I need this done through this date. So you can do that as well, um, as long as they give it to you before um, the application closes. 
All right, and for uh, the academic transcript, so the official transcript from all universities attended are required. So the transcript must indicate all the courses and the subjects that you have taken, and the grades um, indicate where the course was taken and certified by the school, you know, uh, for example, the registrar's office or the controllers of examination. So your resume and CV also must be included. Um, you know, this needs to encompass a compilation of your work experience, your education. Um, yeah, for this one, ideally, we hope that um, it does not exceed four pages. So Emily said they, she can't hear me. Um, is anyone else having this issue? Are you um, able to hear me well? We can hear you. Can hear you well. Okay, all right. Emily, you might want to log out and then log in again or check your um, settings. But everybody else can hear me quite well, right? Yes, thank you. Yep. Okay, great, thanks. Guys. All right, so a letter of invitations as well. We also need that um, from the US University of Choice. Um, it is required um, to be obtained provided upon application submission, however, you know, let's say um, you were not able to meet the deadline and then you were saying that, okay, I need two more days, um, you know, you do write into us because I know sometimes it takes some time. Um, but please let us know and send us an email so that we are uh, alerted and we can put a note on there as well. Okay. So I hope you guys are following so far. Are you guys okay? Great. All right. I can see some nods, so that's a good sign. Okay. So... Here are all the documents that need to be uploaded online. Um, so first is the letter of invitation, your degree certificate, your passport copy, your academic transcript, your sabbatical leave letter. So this letter usually, you know, uh, from your universities or from your um, institution and saying that you are eligible to be away from work and some also stated that you will also be paid during this time, we also need this letter at hand. Uh, and if you're carrying or bringing a dependent on you, we also need a source of financial support for all your accompanying dependents. All right. So this is also another frequently asked question, what are we looking for when we select candidates? What um, what is the selection committee looking at? So these are all the aspects that uh, you know we pay attention to through multiple rounds of um, shortlisting and reviewing um, academic excellence. You know, applicants are typically required um, to have a strong academic record, uh, record, including a high GPA and relevant coursework. Um, again, the project proposal it must be well defined and feasible research. Um, you know and that's a relevance of the project to the host country, which is the US and us, and also to your future goals. We will also take that into consideration. Relevance to the provide, uh, Fulbright goal. So the project that you are doing or the research, um, you know, it's aligned with the goals of the Fulbright programs of promoting mutual understanding, um, you know, culture exchange collaboration between countries. Um, like I also mentioned cultural ambassadorship. Uh, you know, you're not just there to do research, to study, to teach, you're also our cultural ambassadors. So we need those who can exhibit the potential to serve um, as cultural ambassadors um, and demonstrate a certain level of commitment to cross-cultural understandings and engagement. Um, language proficiency, leadership and service, project visibility in terms of resources, access to you know, facilities and collaboration with local uh, institutions and individuals is also evaluated. Um, yeah, this is also something that, you know, our, our committee has um, shared, you know, they look into the potential impact, you know. So what can you bring uh, to the table, you know, uh, the potential impact of the applicant's project on your academic and professional development, um, as well as its contribution to the host country educational culture and landscape is also taken into consideration. All right. So these are, and then of course, the prof your professional goal and letters of recommendations as well. So looking at the timeline uh, or the application process, so you need to submit to us uh, the completed application with what we have shared before this by November 14. 
Um, and then we will take um, some time to review each and every application that has been submitted and completed. And then we will call for interview. And then, um, you know, once at that, we will shortlist um, the applications. And then once you're nominated, we will send this over to our counterpart in DC. Then the US Department of State will begin um, reviewing your project proposal, your application. And this usually takes up the largest uh, or you know, a huge chunk of the time. Um, this could go up to two to three months as well. Um, and then afterwards, we will also uh, we will only then receive the scholarship announcement whether you get in or not. So that is what is to uh for you to you know kind of like I'm um, managing your expectations as well in terms of the timeline. It does not the turnover time is quite a long. Uh, it does not happen very fast. All right, so. Right now, enough about me, <laughs> enough about hearing my voice. I'm going to pass it over um, to our alumni, Dr. Nuhayati Abdullah and Dr. Wahida Hashim, um, you know, to kind of like share um, a little bit about the experience. And then, uh, you know, you will also have the opportunity to throw in your question. So maybe I'll get Dr. Nuhayati first to share a little bit about yourself. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good afternoon. Thank you, Sophie, for the generous introduction. And uh, also, I think um, very insightful information on uh, Fulbright US ASEAN as a whole. So, let me see, what is this? Okay. So I'm Yati from UTM, University Technology Malaysia. I was selected for US ASEAN Fulbright Academic Scholar Scheme back in the year 2016 and 2017. Uh, during that time, I did my study on environmental engineering, focusing on anaerobic treatment of wastewater at University of Michigan and Arbor. So uh, now it has been a couple of years since I completed my US ASEAN Fulbright sojourn in the US. It has been fantastic. And I look forward to share some of my experiences from the application, um, the before, during, and after Fulbright um, experiences with you all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Nyadi. Uh, Dr. Waida, the floor is yours. Hi everyone, assalamualaikum and very good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Macy, for this opportunity. Um, I've been selected for Fulbright US ASEAN uh, just recently finished uh, this year in May 2023. So very fresh <laughs> experience. And um, my background is basically telecommunication engineering. And uh, I'm from University Tenaga National. So when I got the Fulbright, my focus is basically on the uh, internet rural broadband. So I was sent to, I mean, I'm not sent, I mean, I got the opportunity to go to the rural area of the US. <laughs> it's a little bit different. All right, okay. Welcome to any questions from you all. All right, so maybe I'll kick, uh, I mean, I'll kick start this session and all that. Um, I think, you know, looking at our, um, Historically speaking, right, our application is actually can be quite daunting. It's very lengthy. It's very extensive. Um, not a lot of people who started the application would manage to complete everything and actually submit it. Um, but you guys did, right? I mean, you went on the program, you came back. Maybe you could share some tips on, you know, how you manage and your, you know, the process of completion um, from A to Z and then what helped. You know, what were the key elements that helped you stand out as a an, uh, a successful application? Maybe you could share that. Uh, maybe Dr. Oida, you want to start? I had this determination of I really want this Fulbright because I know it's a, it's a very prestige, uh, prestigious award. And um, I really, you know, I really target for that, to be honest. Tak malu cakap lah. Like, I really, really want it. So, um it is true that the process can take almost a year from your application until you uh, went for your uh, attachment. But then it's like you really have to keep, uh, you know, 
I, I would say to myself during that time, if I cannot finish uh, 100% uh, looking at this Fulbright process, then one or two percent every two days uh, is okay for me. Yeah. So that, that kind of drive that made me, because there are quite a lot of challenges, but for some reason, uh, I manage. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Hey, just a quick follow-up uh, follow question. You said that you've always wanted this. How long have you been, you know, eyeing to apply for this program? Yes, I started uh, applying for Fulbright for uh, another program in 2017. I was not successful. And then when I, then I sort of like put off one or two years because I just don't know what, because I know at that time my project was not that strong. So I went to continue on the community project and I know that I got quite a good substance to apply for this Fulbright US ASEAN. So when I apply, I already have these pictures uh, or the community works because I know US ASEAN, if you read the description, they are solely focused to solve issues related to uh, one of the areas is related to ASEAN issues and internet broadband is, is really a thing in, in ASEAN. And yes, that was, that was I, I had the confidence at, at that time, so I applied. Ah, very interesting. All mm -hmm. right, so I'll just throw back the same question um, to Dr. Nuri Hayati. You know, what are some of your tips? You know, how did you manage and complete the application for US ASEAN? What helped? Okay, uh, thank you, Sophie. And uh, very interesting to hear insights from Dr. Wahida. So as for me, uh, I finished my PhD back in 2013. And then after five years of service with UTM, uh, at that moment, I was thinking uh, I wanted to go for a sabbatical leave, but I wasn't eligible just yet during that time, back in 2015 and 2016. And then uh, just so happened on that day, my co-supervisor for my PhD study, I was doing study on palm oil mill effluent. So we were doing aerobic granulation for the treatment of that uh, complex wastewater. Uh, I'm sure some of you are familiar with palm oil. Uh, Malaysia is the second exporter after Indonesia for the oil. So uh, that was basically my PhD topic. And just so happened that day, my co-supervisor for my PhD study came to visit me in uh, UTM, Johor Bahru that time, all the way from Newcastle University in the UK. So the story was, uh, I was telling him like, all right, Tom, uh, I have completed my PhD and now I'm serving as a senior lecturer. And then I was thinking that uh, I would like to do something, but I'm not eligible for a sabbatical leave just yet during that time. And then I, I asked him, uh, I would like to apply for a fellowship. And then I have Google around and then I found out about two opportunities that time. So one is Fulbright, the other one is Shivening Scholarship. And then since I graduated from the UK for my master's study and also my PhD study, and I have never been to the US before. And then I told Tom and then I said, I would like to go to the US. And I found via Google about Fulbright, but I know nothing about it, nothing at all. Absolutely nothing, no idea about Fulbright at all. But Tom, on the other hand, he has already two graduated PhD students under his supervision who went for Fulbright from the UK. And I think the other country was from Brazil. So, and then he said, oh, so he was explaining to me about Fulbright. And then he was saying that, um, I might be able to apply and he recommended a host from University of Michigan and Arbor, which was mm -hmm. Professor Nancy Love, um, a, a professor in environmental engineering in uh, Michigan. Just so happened that I have been actually emailing Nancy at some point of my life throughout my involvement in the International Water Association, which is an NGO that caters for young water professionals, which I was involved in as a young PhD student. So uh, the circle was almost complete at that time. And I was saying, Tom, I know Nancy, we have been talking over email about so many different things, but not on Fulbright. And then uh, he said, why not I send you an email 
and then recommending for you to apply to Michigan. So mm -hmm. the rest was history. So the connection was, I have been with this professor for some other topics and subjects. Mm -hmm. And then Tom came along for a visit. And then I wanted to go for a for a for a short, you know, for a short term attachment somewhere and looking for a funding. And then he was recommending Nancy, and the circle was just almost complete. But um, the Fulbright deadline at that time was merely, I think, a month plus. So I had around six weeks to sort out the online application. I think it's a bit different from what we have now on a uh, Fulbright system, Macy's system. And then uh, I have together all the things that Sophie mentioned just now uh, during her presentation and introduction about Fulbright and how to apply the host letter and then the invitation letter from Michigan, which is now not so difficult for me, God bless, because of Tom's you know, introduction. So that was basically my story. Uh, I, I simply started by uh, Googling and trying to finding out if there's any fellowship with funding uh, for me to go abroad uh, for that short term uh, attachment because uh, I can't go for so long. Uh, the application was, as you said, uh, longish and tedious. And uh, there are a lot of aspects that you have to have to complement and making sure that your proposal is the winning one. Uh, so I think Sophie mentioned there's one slide specifically about recommendation that is super important because uh, the professor who uh, sponsors or recommends you would have and must have some nice words to describe you when they are sending you to the US. So that's super important. And I had um, my professor from Lund University, uh, uh, Sweden. So he is one of my uh, proposer. He was my external examiner for my PhD. And then I had Tom, of course, and then I had Nancy to support and host me at uh, in in Michigan. Yeah, so it's a, it's a it's a simple Google, but yeah, the circle was almost complete. I didn't know nothing about Fulbright, but I'm very happy to be with Fulbright family now. Thank you. Wow, what a story! I mean, like the whole connections and all that, you know. <laughs> so it was great. Um, all right. Um. Let's just touch a bit more on application because that's where most of you guys are at right now before we delve into you know, your experience in the US and all that. Which portion of the application takes up, uh, you know, gives you the most headache, but actually, you know, and what was your um, tips and tricks to, you know, kind of like simplify that process to make it less intimidating and less burdensome, to, to put it bluntly. Uh, Dr. Wayda, maybe you want to share? Me getting the recommendation letter um, or preparing the proposal, which one of it? Yes, the hardest part for me is okay, when you apply, you can just fill up the form. That's not that's not any issue. But I was lucky enough in a way that when I apply, I did not have any placement yet at that time. Because Fulbright is basically my first US collaboration um activities. Um, <clears throat> I'm also not a US graduate, so it's kind of challenging to, you know, first time you ask for placement already. So the second one is the support letter from the university, because uh, in Uni 10, if you want to apply for the support letter, um, normally you have to go all this Senate meeting and so on. And I applied Fulbright US ASEAN within two weeks only. Um, so what I did is basically, maybe there's tips they can use. What I did is basically I, wrote, I draft a letter to my dean. Uh, then I put uh, one sentence uh, of like, but this is subject to the approval of the management of Uniten to support the Wahida to go for Fulbright, blah, blah, blah. So that is acceptable for Macy at that time. And about the host, I I did not, I, I just be honest saying that I don't have any placement yet. But of course, during after the moment that uh, I sort of like shortlisted for an interview, I started looking for placement. You have some ideas who you want to contact. But to be honest with you, this is rather challenging because I email almost like 20 
to 30 placement and I can sense that some of my emails get into the um, mailbox, the spam mailbox yeah. and so on. Yeah. So, and then uh, I asked for the other friends who are, who I, uh, the organizer of a conference, who knew a friend and I was lucky enough to basically get the right place for my research. Um, yeah, that is the hardest part. And whoever wants to bring your children. Uh, so I, I also did bring my daughter and I put him in the rural school in, in the, at, at the university, nearby the university. And also, and then after that, when you got the, the placement of uh, the accommodation, but that one can be later. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That was very helpful. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Yati, what okay. about you? Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Wahida. Um, uh, unlike Dr. Wahida, my experience is probably a bit different. Uh, her research on um, IoT and internet connections and technology is booming at the time uh, now. So because she just came back from her Fulbright bite for myself during my application, uh, palm oil is considered as a competitive uh, commodity. So as I am submitting my proposal, uh, it has been a huge question as to uh, how might we learn from the US institution on the treatment of palm oil, as well as making sure that it does not sound as competitive to, to which um, the other type of oil oils in the world is not is not being challenged. So uh, it's, it's, it's from the more from the research perspective point of view, because I'm using palm oil, but in the US they are famous for olive oil, you know, all the, yep. all the other kinds of corn oil, sunflower oil. So what is it so special that I wanted to bring palm oil into the picture? Because they have different kinds of oils and they trust their oils rather than our oil. So something like that. Um, so it becomes tricky uh, when it comes to the proposal preparation, but uh, Alhamdulillah, I get good support from Nancy at the time and Tom. And uh, what we finally wanting to look at is the technology rather than focusing on the treatment of the specific oil. So um, because I wanted to go in winter, as Malaysia does not have winter and US is famous for its extreme winter weather. So uh, I wanted to come in uh, winter months. So uh, my plan as part of the proposal was to investigate and observe how the wastewater treatment plant operates uh, in the snow. Uh, I managed to do that. I went and uh, had a side visit uh, at, the, uh, at one of the uh, a wastewater treatment plant during the winter time in the thick snow. So it was amazing experience because I've never seen one in winter time, not even during um, site, visiting at, uh, site visit at conferences. So apart from the application and then making sure that all the documents are in place within the stipulated deadline, uh, Alhamdulillah, I managed. Uh, the application went through smoothly. It was tedious. You've got to really write down your objective of study and then what is it the outcome that you are expecting from the four months or three months research tenure in the US because it's not so long. Four months is really, really short. You've got to spend at least two weeks to just finding your way from your home to your university and where the bus stops are and things like that. But the research is, is amazing. So for me, my challenge is preparing the research proposal simply because the oil that I chose is uh, something that can be a challenge to other type of oils in the mm -hmm. US. And then uh, because I wanted to go in, in winter time. So that has been one of my uh, winning fit of the proposal because we don't have winter in Malaysia. So I said, I would like to see how the wastewater treatment plants operates in winter. And then they feel like, oh, okay, yes, that's something new. And then uh, making sure that the proposal uh, applies to both the US and the ASEAN. Uh, so it has to be something that is being highlighted at the ASEAN level. Uh, what is it that attracts uh, ASEAN as a whole or what is in for ASEAN at that time? Thank you. 
great, fantastic. I love all the, your sharings. I hope you guys find it also um, you know, helpful in preparing and then making sure your application stands out. Um, so enough about that. So let's go and I will I'm very curious. I feel like you guys also probably are. Um, you know about your experience in the US, you know, as a Fulbright scholar, finally after going through all of these processes, you know, you're in the US. So how was that like for you guys? You know, what was just what was your experience during your time in the US? You know, how did you um adapt to the cultural differences? Um and you, you know, make the most out of your stay? Uh Dr. Yati, maybe you want to share? Okay. Um uh besides the proposal challenges. Uh, preparing the proposal challenges, I had I had huge challenge finding uh, accommodation. I know our former uh, USSM Fulbrighter, she was in contact with me as well, Dr. Hui Ling, if you know her from USM, she was also finding difficulties in, in, in getting uh, accommodation because it is scarce and also limited. I was blessed, I think, to mention that uh, I somehow... Uh, email so many, so many, so, so many people um, during my pursuit to get uh, accommodation within the campus area. And I met two Chinese Malaysian student, undergraduate student, uh, because I am already senior lecturer at the time, they were hesitant to share their, their apartments with me. You see, so it's like I'm already working and then they are uh, freshman year in their freshman year and then they say oh oh she's already a PhD uh, graduate how can we share our apartment with her and things like that uh, but I managed to convince them uh, at least Jen, uh, Jen Lin uh, who was my uh, roommate at the time so uh, eventually cut the story short uh, I got a, a bed in, in the apartment so the three of us girls staying together I remember it was at the university towers uh, and then all three girls and I met a couple of Malaysian students also staying uh, in the block. So I'm like their big sister, you know, because I'm staying with the undergraduate students, which I do not mind at all, uh, probably because of my petite sign. So I fit in very well. So <laughs> it's really, really nice. Uh, and upon arriving in the US, things are very, very different. Mm, people are very friendly and receptive of your multicultural and differences. And then uh, I remember there was one talk that was given one by one of the famous author. Uh, and I, I attended most of the programs because uh, I stayed with the undergraduates. And the only thing to blend in is just to join them in whatever programs and activities that they went to. So I went to ballet performance. We went for theater shows. It was Christmas time. We went to our favorite bookshop down the old town of uh, Ann Arbor for literati and then uh, we always went for the free bagel adventure on Thursday in our pajamas but nobody knows so it was really fun time uh, and besides that lifestyle and cultural changes and adapting to a younger lifestyle with the undergraduate students uh, in university towers I get to meet uh, an awesome uh, postgraduate groups uh, of students at my department who are all doing uh, excellent work on environmental engineering, different kind of wastewater treatment. And we have every Tuesday a uh, club called General Club Presentation, where everyone is welcome to bring potluck by turn. So we do alternate potluck days on every Tuesday. Uh, it's really, really aspiring and reaching inspiring and motivational experience for me. Uh, I really, really love uh, my stay in the US. I kind of miss it now. Uh, there's a nice arboretum behind our apartment for a nice 45 to 60 minutes walk. So we made it, we made it a point that every weekend we should go there and walk in the winter. So it's really nice, it's really nice. And uh, I teach them how to cook, the undergraduate students. So. Before I left the US, I even donated all my pots and pets to, uh, pens to them. <laughs> that they would, you know, they would know how to eat greens and things like that. So it's really, really nice experience, uh, lifestyle wise, as well as professional wise. Uh, I get to see the wastewater treatment uh, once that is actively operating during the winter time in the winter. Thank you. That's amazing. Hi, right, Dr. Weida, what about you? How was your experience? <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Nahayati. That's very, you know, it's very interesting. Um, the, 
going for the Fulbright is not my was not my first time going to the US, but usually I went to US to the big cities. But this is the first time that I went to Kampung. And I really looking forward for that because I don't think Malaysian will go to Kampung whenever you do your vacation. So usually you take this opportunity to to experience that. So in Texas, uh, there are like in rural Texas, you got to experience this cowboy thing. I went to the place where you can see all this, what you call that, the, you know, the uh, when you when you have the oil, I don't know what is the word for that. You know, when you dig the oil, what is the, the word for that? I can't. Yeah. So, you know, we're well, running out of my mind for that. So the I oil experienced rings. that. The yeah, oil yeah, oil rings. Yeah. And then um, to the field, to the almost everything, the cowboy, the uh, the horses, cattle, and, and this kind of, I don't think... For some people, maybe not not a really nice experience, but I had a really good good time. So the town that I went is sixty five percent car dependent. So this is a very challenging because there is there was only one uh, company enterprise car that you can rent the car from. So the price of the car is more expensive than the accommodation. And I have to agree, uh, I, I agree with Dr. Nohayati that accommodation is one of the most challenging because in the US, uh, if you they don't want to rent you out for under six months. So if you want, then it is not uh, fully furnished. So I went to Airbnb and then I got this little American cottage, which is just like, nice for two of us and because I brought my daughter as well and it's like five minutes walking distance from from the university and then luckily that the rent is all inclusive fully furnished in that utilities whatever charges of the rubbish and and so on so um so that one is soft and then uh, another challenging is the car because in Texas, if you uh, if you are walking, it's kind of weird because it's not the state where you walk. Mm -hmm. So you might walk because you had your car broken or what? And then it's not that safe as well. And when I went in the rural, then, you know, there was one, this gun shooting cases in one of the school. So we kind of like, you have to watch that, that one out as well. But then other than that, um, was really nice experience because I also traveled to other states to visit other laboratory. And we cover almost like maybe six, seven states, uh, which is quite a lot in four months because yeah. out of four months, uh, one month you have to allocate for the managing of the uh, lot of paperwork kind of thing. And then you had the opportunity to go to Washington DC as well uh, for the US, uh, you know, the sort of like department state uh, gathering. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the best thing ever. I mean, my Fulbright experience, I just want to tell you that so far in my career as a lecturer is one of the best things. <laughs> uh, sorry, may, may I add, uh, Sophie, on yeah. something? Uh, because sure. Dr. Wahida mentioned she went to, to Washington for the U.S. Uh, Fulbright gathering. Uh, my gathering was in Los Angeles. And then uh, we were on a big ship, I think, crossing some kind of uh, straits. Um, yeah, I had a fever that time, but I can, I remember we were on a big ship crossing some streets. Uh, we were going and to, we were going to visit, we visited uh, Maryland University. Okay. Yes, we visited Maryland University and we visited also, uh, what what is it called? The, where uh, Forrest Gump made that movie, you know, the, mm -hmm. the yes, uh -huh. so that, yeah, that bit of, of uh, Los Angeles. Uh, and then I met so, so, so many other Fulbrighters beyond U.S. ASEAN uh, during that gathering in, in, in L.A. It was really, really nice. I agree with Dr. Wahida. It's really, really nice. Uh, so just, just you know, just, just make sure you, you send in a winning proposal based on the tips that we've shared with you and also uh, based on the guidelines that um, uh, Sophie has shared. And I must mention that um, uh, I have family. 
And then it's not easy to leave family, but uh, I'm speaking to all of the women here uh, because probably for men, it, it might be easier for you to decide to leave for four months and, you know, but for all of the uh, women uh, candidates, um, if you already have family, you have small children, small kids, there's no stopping or limiting you to send in a Fulbright application. Because uh, when I went back in 2016, 2017, my youngest child, I have three, and my youngest boy uh, was around uh, four or five years old at that time. And he's fine now, he's 10. I mean, he's, uh, you know, an avid footballer and all, but there's no stopping you if you are a woman having family, having children, there's no stopping for you to send in Fulbright application. All right? So just, just so you know. <laughs> thank <that>. you yes. <laughs> what a nice way to wrap this up great thank you you two so much for you know all your input and sharing i'm sure um the audience uh you know managed to pick up some tips and advices as well um we're about three minutes to end the call do we have any questions from the floor i know we have one in the chat box uh, so I'll just read that out while the rest of you take some time to think about it. Uh, Dr. Waida and Dr. Hayati, one of the attendees is asking, based on experience, what would be the best starting date for those who are planning to go for the program? Is it in the winter, during fall? You know, what would be your advice for that? And then Erwin, um, we will go with your question, yeah? Yeah. Uh, uh, my concern at that time, like I want to start at the beginning of the semester so that it will not uh, overlap with my current work in uni as the one in the US. So I went in early January and Texas is okay in early January, but of course, if you are in Boston, that is not the best time. Yeah, it's going to be very chilly. <laughs> All right. So you pick based on the semester. But what about you, Atayati? How do you pick? You said you went to winters, right? Because that yes, aligns with your yes. proposal. Uh, okay. I, I wanted to go in winter, specifically wanted to go in winter time so that I would have the heaviest winter ever uh, in the US. I know, I mean, I have stayed in the UK before. It's just that winter in the US uh, is different. So uh, originally, I should be going around uh, April, May, June, summertime. But my supervisor was not available at that time. And then uh, there's something I can't remember, which was uh, another limiting factor for me to go during that time. So we ended up uh, securing the time time timeline for November 2016 until around March 2017. Eventually, I got the winter time. It depends on, um, for me, it depends on the arrangement between myself and, and my, my supervisor and my host at the time. Yes. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Erin, yes, uh, you have yeah. Yeah, yep. thank, thank, thank you very much, Sophie. Uh, thank you, Wahida and Dr. Nohayati. I think it's amazing to hear your stories. I think it's very, um, very brilliant, inspiring. I got four questions actually. Uh, my first, my first question is: uh, You spoke about the time frame uh, on it's, as long as the three months is within the academic year. Am I am I correct? Uh, the second question is: uh, Three to four months is the period where the Fulbright Scholar uh, grant is. Can it be two months instead? Uh, my third question here is that, uh, do you have to apply a separate grant for your research? Are the grants sufficient for your accommodation uh, and transport? Uh, the fourth question here is that, in the application form, there is a question where asks uh, professional travel and residence abroad uh, that exceeds three months duration in the US. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking because I'm a research fellow at Harvard Medical School right now and a fellow at the Center for Bioethics at Harvard Medical School as well. So I'm just thinking, what should I put there? And my last question, I'm so sorry, I've got so many questions because you're so inspiring. I'm currently a, a pediatrician. Uh, I have a fellowship uh, with the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health in the UK. I'm also uh, a research fellow at Harvard Medical School. When you mentioned about the PhD requirement or equivalent, uh, my, my important question, because that was not listed in the website, is, uh, am I eligible? Because uh, I'm just worried about that again. Uh, thank you very much. Um, All right. If, yeah, yeah, okay, we have one. 
Oh, okay. I, I remember only the third questions about the cost. That's really a concern to me. So the cost is sufficient, but because I don't, uh, you know, I don't rent a car. So how do I solve the problem? Uh, yeah, because I went after pandemic, there are quite a number of residents who does not have job. I mean, they have to work between two cities, San Antonio and also Victoria. So I was in Victoria. So so what I offer to them when I use the Uber, do, would you like to be my driver? I mean, I just call and then she said, okay. And then that's how I keep my budget uh, below the, the allowance that Fulbright gave. So the yeah. Fulbright is able to cover the accommodation and the transport? Uh... Yes. Uh, yes. 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 More than enough, actually. Yeah, more than enough. Okay. Mm. I All think right. I think for question for question one, uh, two and and four is probably for 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 Sophie or or Lina to answer. But for the cost, um, during my time we have been advised to prefer a, a one month advance cost by using our own money because it will take some time before you completed all of the necessary documents. Uh, and opening a US bank account and uh, obtaining your social security number. Uh, I made it a point to check on these dates uh, just now. So it takes about around a month uh, for us, for me, to receive my, um, uh, my grant into my US account. So let's say I arrive in Michigan on 28th of November, 2016. And then you have to fill up a notification of arrival form with the IIE on the 30th of November. And then uh, I managed to get my uh, checking number for my uh, account at Michigan University on the 5th of December. Uh, and then I fill up the grant deposit form and using my checking number and ABA routing number, uh, I receive my social security number on uh, 30th of no uh, December in 2016. Then only, I think I received my first disbursement of my grant in January. And then that also includes my uh, delayed grant for December and November when I first arrived. So you've got to be uh, prepared. I'm sure they will tell you this, but you've got to be prepared for one month at least advance uh, expenses for your own, using your own money before the grant is disbursed to you. And, and number two, for Michigan, for me, uh, the buses are free between campus and campus, probably different from Dr. Wahida. So I just use the bus services uh, all day long. It's for free for all uh, students and residents of the university. And uh, my apartment, because I'm not renting uh, on a specific rent, I just have a bed provided for me in the room and existing lease. So I only pay about 500 US dollars per month for the bed and the room. And I can use every facilities at the uh, at the university tower building. Uh, the rest is just food. Yeah, food and uh, if you want to go somewhere, traveling and things like that. It's more than enough, really. It's more than enough. You just have to prepare for the one month advance. I hope you, that Thank you. Do, do you have to uh, have a separate grant for your research? No, no. Uh, for Fulbright application, uh, as for me, I did not have to state any uh, matching grants or anything like that. Okay. Yep. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Yati and Dr. Waida. So, Erin, um, to answer your question, also the minimum amount for the grant is three months. So, two months we can't. So, three uh, and maximum is four months. Um, I think your another question number four was um, so scholars with PhD are preferred, um, but applicants with master's degree uh, can also be considered. Uh, so a doctorate, uh, medical doctor with a fellowship, uh, and a royal mem member of the royal college. Of yes, you can. However, uh, you know there are also a clause where you cannot um, when you are doing research in university, you can't perform on animals or another human being. So we will send you another form to you know kind of like um establish that. Yet you cannot do that while you are on this grant. Does that make sense? Uh oh, there's a, a clause saying that. Uh, we can't. Uh, what about quali uh, Sorry, a qualitative study on on patients. Sorry, I'm uh, sorry. I, sorry. Uh, I I feel like my line's breaking because it's raining right now. Sorry. Uh, sorry. A, a focus group discussion with patients. Uh, does that fall under the? No, that's fine. That's okay. fine. Okay. All right. Yeah. And 
Basically, yeah. it's a no patient contact. No patient contact. Yes, yeah. that is a, a form that will be sent to you um, that you would need to agree to. Um, mm. Additionally, in terms of research, um, when you reach out to your uh, universities that you want to uh, affiliate yourself with, um, if you need to have access to labs, uh, lab equipment and so forth, this is a question you need to ask your um, potential host institution if there's any lab charges associated with it. Um, because for like some of them, like uh, for Dr. Nohayati and Dr. Wahida, they probably did not use any labs. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a question that you would need to ask uh, mm -hmm. if there's any potential charges for lab usage. And uh, I can then apply for from the 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 the, the cost will be uh, be given by Fulbright. Am I am I right? Um, it, not necessarily because we give a fixed stipend, so it just okay. depends on what it is the cost charges. All right. Um, All right. so I'd like to move to the next question sure. to Dr. Mozart. Thank you, Dr. Mozart Mota. You might want to unmute. Um, all right, before Dr. Mozart starts, I know we are past um, four right now. So if you need to leave, um, you know, please do so. Uh, Dr. Hayati, Dr. Waida, um, are you guys okay to continue this for a bit longer? Because I can see more questions are coming up. Yeah, or I, 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 am, uh, I am traveling shortly, but uh, okay. I can spend maybe another five minutes if there's any right, yeah. questions. Okay. Fantastic. Yes, Dr. Uh, okay. So, um, Hi. I'm Moza okay. Mokhtar from Istimulaya. I'm just asking, do we need to have the uh, the sabbatical letter, that means the month match with the uh, semesters over there? No. Yes. Do so need, does it need to be confirmed that my sabbatical is this month and this month, then, then I apply? Yes, that's right. You need to, it, it needs to match your invitation letter from your US uh, post institution and your sabbatical letter from your, um, uh, you know, your universities or your workplace needs to match these two. So there cannot be any discrepancy or any inconsistencies. Mm. But uh, but doctor, you do not have to go by their semester or our semester. At least that is for UTM case. For for my case with UTM, uh, it does not, uh, I think it, it, it doesn't matter if I go, I go, uh, because I went in uh, November, December, uh, November, December, January, February, March, and that is that is during active semester of UTM and also uh, active semester in the US. But it does not matter if I wanted to go in other months, not concerning the semester because uh, the nature of research in both home and host universities is not bounded to the semester, meaning that the research is ongoing. It can be in any months. Uh. Another, another question from me. Since you you are from the sciences, mm. did you did you mean any uh, fellowships that are from the social sciences? Because I'm from the business school. Okay, uh, I think during the uh, gathering, the the convene of the um, Fulbrighters in LA, I'm not sure about in uh, Washington for Dr. Wahida. Maybe Doctor can advise. But in LA, I met everybody, not just from the sciences. Yeah. Uh, these include people doing policy on environmental engineering. The theme of the gathering was environmental engineering policies, something like that, but uh, not social scientists per se, but I met somebody who is doing policy for environmental uh, engineer, uh, environmental protection and sustainability, for example, uh, doctor. Thank you. Okay, so I think we can only... We have another oh, Dr. Mozart yeah. <laughs> with the hands Ooh. up. So, sorry, sorry. Uh, raising her hand. Yes, Dr. Go on. Okay, uh, I have a question. Uh, I see there that there are, uh, I'm Dr. Azni, by the way. Um, I see that the majority of the Fulbrighters are research oriented, but I saw an option where you have uh, teaching only. Uh, is it more advisable to go for teaching and research? Or uh, is teaching only a, an option that will be considered? Lina, do you want to take that question? Um, 
it actually just depends on the work that you're doing. Um, and uh, we take into consideration your project and uh, what's its impact on the, uh, when you come back, what's going to happen when you come back to Malaysia? How is that work going to impact Malaysia and the ASEAN countries? So um, I know most people sometimes put just research only, uh, but it just depends on the project that you want to do. So there is no, I mean, you're not penalized if you're going to do both. But as Dr. Nohayate and Dr. Wahida said, four months is a very short period. And so um, it goes by really fast. And if your project is very specific and very um, technical oriented, you may want to put that into the plan. Um, another thing about start dates also is, um, as you know, uh, in the US, winter time is mostly Christmas time, New Year time. So two weeks out of the month of December, maybe two weeks out of the month of January, um, your faculty members may not be around, your support staff may not be around. So if you put those dates into the application, you might lose out one month. Um, so that's something else to put into consideration. But like Dr. Nohayati, she went during winter months because she wanted to see a particular uh, process in place during the winter time and she had arranged that. So she's doing that. Um, so please take into consideration when you apply for winter time. Same for summertime. Uh, you need to check with your hosts if they're around because it is, you know, if you're going to a, a new country where you don't know anyone around, it's same for the Americans coming here. We have Dr. William, who is actually um, on this call as well. They will tell you it's a bit difficult to be alone uh, and you don't have any support. So when you are planning for your project, please do put in the dates that is convenient for your host. Uh, for your host university, because uh, you would need a lot of support from the university itself, especially for like Dr. Wahida, who went to a kampong area, <laughs> the countryside. Uh, most times in the summer, if it's a university town, the town will be empty during summer <laughs> periods and winter periods. So you don't want to be stuck in, you know, in a place for a month that takes out of your, um, your grant period. Uh, um, maybe I would like to share, oh, Lina, sorry. Sure. No, go ahead. Oh, no. Uh, about the research, I understand the situation. When I propose, it is something that I'm supposed to do for the rural uh, area. But then I shift a little bit when I arrive because uh, my the host university recommended me to see the coalition from um, Texas Connected Nation. So Texas Connected Nation is a very big uh, organization, I mean, NGO sort of not really NGO, but they govern the uh, plan for implementation of internet broadband in Texas. So um, so this, my host university, they asked me to go to see one of the, uh, not like a president of this coalition. And then from there, they asked me to join one of the, uh, I mean, the, the Connected Nation itself asked me to attend another summit. So this is where the place where I met a lot of industry policymakers, um, you know, uh, te technical universities and so on. So that I can say, one, uh, save one month of my work because of this uh, networking. So I, I shift a little bit, but but I really satisfied because this is the thing that I want. Thank you, Dr. Wahida. I just want to answer one question that some Emily Lau had asked. How do we find potential hosts? Uh, I think uh, Dr. Nohayati and Dr. Wahida has answered that question, but a few th a few tips would be um, look at the universities that specialize in your area um, and you can find the information about the uh, uh the people or the uh, scholars who are specific in those fields in their university websites. Most of these websites do share their email addresses. Um, you can find them on LinkedIn as well um, uh, and connect with the universities. Uh, that's how you would connect with your, but if you do not have any network in the US. Uh, Sophie, back to you. All right, thank you so much, everybody. I think we would have to cut off um, the call now. Um, thank you so much for all of your questions, for your attention. Uh, it's such a pleasure having Dr. Waida, Dr. Ayati on the call with us today. I hope it was beneficial to all. I hope to see all of you are on this call, you know, submit a, a really good quality application and proposals and we'll see you. Um, if you have more questions, I'm sorry, we can't address everything, 
do drop us an email. Uh, we'll get to you. We'll answer all of your questions again. Uh, we will also put up this recording on our website. Um, once again, thank you very much. Have a good day. Stay safe. Oh, before and, we leave, we're going to take yeah. a group picture. So if everybody okay. can get off yeah. the uh, can come on camera so we can do a quick picture of everybody who's joining us. Uh, while everyone is turning off their camera, just to let you know, I've shared the email on our chat group, fullbrightmalaysia at macy.org.my. Information can be found on our website, which I've shared on the link as well. Uh, so if you can get everybody on the camera, let's show everyone's handsome faces. Yay, you can see more now. Perfect. Hi, Dr. William. Thank you for joining. Dr. William is our US scholar in Malaysia. She, he's currently based in UKM. Uh, so if you want to get hold of him, you know where to find him, University Kabangsaan, Malaysia. Okay, so I'm going to do a quick picture. Everyone smile. All right. Thank you again, everyone. And uh, everybody. wishing everybody a wonderful rest of the week. And please do contact us if you need any help with your application. Yep. Yeah. Bye. 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 Bye.